Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study, uh, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons is challenging one, a very important one on preparation for the end time. This particular lesson is lesson number five of that series entitled Christ in the Heavenly Sanctuary. Hmm. Let's see what that could be about. Uh, I hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to spend quite a bit of time uh, looking at verses. And we always like to begin with a word of prayer. If you pray with us. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these bits of guidance, these, these truths that we gather from Scripture. Help us to know how to put them together correctly so that we come up with the right conclusions is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This lesson will focus on what is almost a unique Seventh-day Adventist teaching, which we believe is clearly supported by Scripture, and we'll see if you agree with us by the time we get to the end. It talks about Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, what He's doing now, what He's done in the past, what He's going to do in the future. Do you understand that clearly? Well, we can start right off with an interesting statement from Ellen White. Uh, Carrie, I think you've got that. Yes. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. Every individual has a soul to save or to lose. Each has a case pending at the bar of God. Each must meet the great judge face to face. How important then that every mind contemplate often the solemn scene when the judgment shall sit and the book shall be open, when with Daniel every individual must stand in his lot at the end of the days. It comes from the Great Controversy, page 488, paragraph 2. Thank you. So why would that study be so important? especially in the last days. Um, so let's just review once again <coughs> our understanding of the Great Controversy. The Great Controversy began where? In heaven. heaven. In heaven. It came to this earth when our first parents, Adam and Eve, agreed with the devil that uh, God maybe couldn't be trusted, and we all subsequently have been sinners outside of the Garden of Eden. Over a period of time, the major events of the Great Controversy have happened down through the years as we have gotten further and further away from God. Then Jesus came and He lived that incredible life. The devil did everything he possibly could to get Jesus to sin, to get Him to give up and go back to heaven, to get anything he could, but he failed. And Jesus went all the way to the point where He, he suffered that absolutely awful death on the cross after being beaten and all that sort of stuff and still uncomplaining like a lamb for the slaughter and lived through all that and died and then we'll see a little bit later what happened um, after all that was over. When it comes down to the third coming, now the book of uh, Revelation, the the, 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 the uh, Apostle John, clear at the end of his book, says there's not only going to be a second coming, there's going to be a thousand year period after the second coming, and then there's going to be a third coming. At the, at the time of that third coming, Revelation describes, and Ellen White expounds on that, that there's going to be a great panorama when the great controversy that I've just very, very briefly described is going to be seen scattered across the heavens so that every person all the people inside the city, the righteous, all the angels, all the beings in the rest of the universe, as well as all the wicked people outside are going to be able to see the step by step what happened through the whole history of our world. And at the end of that, what's going to happen? Even the devil is going to be down on his knees saying, God, you did everything you possibly could. Here's the verses for that, Philippians 2. I'm going to read verses 10 and 11. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth and in the world below, that would be the world of the dead, 
will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, that means that Satan is going to be converted and become a saint, right? Nope. No. No, sir. <laughs> no way. But the arguments will be so compelling that not even Satan can, can say anything. It's just, it's like going to a movie or something like that or watching a, a, a program and you just move to tears or something, and then be a little bit later, you maybe have a completely different emotion. So that this, this presentation is going to be so compelling that everybody's going to be on their knees. So what good is it if it doesn't convert somebody? Oh, it's very good. That's an important question, but it's very good because it will make it very clear to every single person who has ever lived that God did everything he possibly could to win everybody. There won't be no questions at the end of that, but the fact that each person will see his own role in that whole thing, everybody will say, if they're outside, they'll say, I know why I'm outside. If they're inside, they will say, I know why I'm inside. And God will say, is it all right now for me to wind things up? And everyone will say, yeah, there's nothing more. No one's going to change their mind. There's nothing more you can do. It's time to wrap it up. Yeah. The way I read this text, it seems that Every knee shall bow means that everybody will recognize the truth. Yes, exactly. That doesn't mean they will adhere to it. Yeah, no, that's true. Exactly. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So the ultimate purpose of the great controversy is to fully and completely eliminate sin. Anybody want to argue with that? Hope not. But this can only happen by causing a real change in God's people. Because how many of us are sinners? We're all sinners. So we've got to have a change if, 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 the, if the great controversy is going to be successful. Uh, we must see and believe that God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that they can be trusted. Then we must be willing to follow God's guidance for us. Somehow, God needed to demonstrate the truthfulness of his statement made back in the Garden of Eden, as recorded in Genesis 2.17. And you know what that statement says. Let's just look at that really quick. In my computer do thing is do thing. except the tree actually we should start with verse 16 he said to them you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad you must not eat the fruit of that tree if you do you will die the same day that's uh, a pretty uh, scary scenario um, so Are the we question talking just about behavior here well, we're talking about rebellion. I know, but, but rebellion... It's another word for so, sin. It's another word for sin? Mm -hmm. that's, that's your definition of sin, is rebellion? Yeah, that's what the, the Bible's definition of sin. Well, that's your interpretation of what the Bible says is definition well, of sin. Well, okay. <laughs> the, 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 the Greek says, hamartia estin anomia. That's uh, first Thessalonians, I'm sorry, that's First uh, John... 3 verse 4 and that means it just says it's three words it says sin is lawlessness or rebelliousness that's that's what it says just in so many words well i kind of don't quite understand how um how you can instill rebellion into eve just by getting talked into taking the apple well she chose she chose at that point. She knew. She said what, she knew very well what God had said. She quoted it to the devil. And yet he convinced her somehow to say, no, I'm rebelling against what God told me, and I'm going to take the apple instead. That's why it's the mystery of iniquity. Yeah. It uh, yeah. makes no sense looking in from the outside. Well, we're kind of hitting it like it makes sense, and we're making explanations, though. Yeah. Well, well we do we're not we're not trying to make we're not trying to say that what Eve did makes sense. We're saying that the the if you look at the arguments on both sides, looking at it now from our perspective, it does not make sense what she did. Um, anyway, so God has to finally convince. Well, and, and of course we know that in the next chapter, in, in chapter three, what does Satan say to Eve? about God's statement? That's a lie. It's a lie. You won't die. 
Yeah, that's a lie. So Satan starts off, I mean, almost the first words we have out of his mouth are, God is a liar. Do you buy that or don't you? Um, Did he use the word liar? Well, it depends on how you translate it, I guess. Kind of sounded to me like um, Eve, you misunderstood him. Yeah. Or you misunderstood, but you won't die. Well, but if you say you won't die, what are you saying? God says you will die. Someone else says you won't die. What are you saying? You're saying God is a liar. I don't know how you can interpret that any other way. Well, thousands of years later, Christ became a human being, laying aside his divinity, living that incredible life, and finally dying the death of a common criminal. That's the first part of Philippians 2, 6 to 8. In a way that we cannot possibly fully understand, the divinity of Christ did not die when Jesus died on the cross. Although Jesus had access to his divinity throughout his ministry, and no doubt even earlier in his life, and of course we don't know the details of that, that divinity was apparently quiescent during the nine months he was in the womb, and maybe for some time after that, obviously, um, you know, a six-month-old or a one, even a one-year-old would not really know what to do with the divinity, I don't think. I mean, from what I know about <laughs> kids that age. But uh, he never took advantage of the, his divinity to make his human life any easier. But after his death on the cross and that brief time in the tomb, he was ready to resume his position in heaven. And we have a ver uh, the, the next passage there. Yes, uh, Helen G. G. White, uh, a quote from Desire of Ages, page 785, says, When the voice of the mighty angel was heard <coughs> at Christ's tomb, saying, Thy father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now was proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and the rulers, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. This is from John 10, 17 and 18, as well as 2, 19. Well, Desire of Ages, page 785, as you said. That's a very important, very, very significant statement. But he came to the world to display, I'm sorry, Gary, I think that's yours. <laughs> he came to the world to display the glory of God that my, man might be uplifted by its restoring power. God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. God revealed no qualities and exercised no power that man may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess. If they will be in subjection to God as he was, yeah, and you said God there instead of Jesus. But Jesus. Jesus were. He, Jesus revealed no qualities. No qualities. Oh. Mm -hmm. Many Christians focus on the fact that Christ's life Same was thing. only for one purpose, and that was to die. That is, he came to die to pay the price of sin. How many times have we heard that? And they quote from, for that uh, verses like, Luke 9, 22. He also said to them, The Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He will be put to death, but three days later he'll be raised to life. Does that verse say that he died to pay the price of sin? Not at all. And there's no words of Jesus that explained what the efficacy of his death would be. Yeah. Since we know that the plan of salvation was put in place back in eternity, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, and other verses. Jesus knew way back then what was coming. His omniscience was never sacrificed. He knew when, when the Godhead got together and made that choice, okay, he's going to come, he's going to be a human being, he's going to do this, we're planning for that. They knew right up front what, all, what that was going to involve. 
So here's a question for you to think about, and you out here, I'll play this, jump, uh, pass this one to you. It's not an easy one. We're not going to get a final answer. How early in his life, this, his earthly life, as he grew up as a child and then as a youth, did Jesus realize that he would eventually die to deal with sin? Now, we do have that verse. That's Romans 8, verse 3. There's other places, too, but Romans 8, verse 3 says, What the law could not do, because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son, who came with a nature like sinful human nature, to do away with sin. Okay, so we have, we have that. Um, how soon did he have an idea that that's why he came? Was it at age 12 when he went to the temple? Long before that. Um, I think so. We're told in Isaiah 50 that God was giving him his instruction every morning. Mm -hmm. And that uh, he was not rebellious in listening to the Father. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, how does it make you feel to realize that the King of the Universe died just for you? There's Grateful. verses. Hmm? That's what you mean by just for you. Well, w what I mean is this. Uh, Ellen White says in a number of places, and the Bible implies in some places, that God, Jesus would have died even if only one person was saved. So, yeah. But the purpose is to answer, uh, to the display the character of, of God. That needed to be that, done to save one person. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing we can do to earn a place in heaven. Jesus did everything that was necessary by fully and completely representing the truth about the Godhead, about Satan, and about sin and its results. That, that's pretty compelling I would say um, look at three passages John 1 29 the lamb, the next day John saw Jesus coming to him and said there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world Revelation 5 12 says and saying in a loud voice the lamb who was killed is worthy to receive power wealth wisdom and strength honor glory and praise and then finally Revelation 13 8 let me go there very quickly um, All people living on earth will worship it except those whose names are written before the creation of the world in the book of the living which belongs to the Lamb that was killed. So obviously the emphasis in those three verses is on what? The Lamb. The lamb. What, what is implied by that Lamb? That something about the sanctuary ser service has significance because that was... Uh, part of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and apart from that, it's just, yeah. you know, wool and, and mutton. Yeah. Well, think of how many passages in, in the Bible, uh, he, the Old Testament, and even some in, we've already mentioned in the New Testament, talk, uh, seem to talk about, okay, you bring a lamb, you offer the lamb, you know, that's the way you deal with your sins kind of stuff. Um, the Aramaic and the Hebrew there, uh, when it says the Lamb of God, it's really saying the divine Lamb. When they don't have a way of, they don't have possessives in, in those languages. So it's, when they, they say Lamb of God, that meaning it means the divine Lamb. To a Jew living in the times of Jesus, or even in the Old Testament times, speaking out about a lamb, a sacrificial lamb, was an unmistakable reference to the sanctuary. But we know that thousands and thousands, I mean, there was a hundred thousand sheep offered just by Solomon at the dedication of his temple. I mean, how many millions of lambs were offered from Adam's day to the time of, of, of Christ? It's just unthinkable. What, came, what brought all that to an end? Do you remember? Us. Sacrifice of Jesus. And what happened at that point in time? Top to bottom, it ripped. Actually, the, the curtain in the temple was ripped from top to bottom. It actually came to an end in year 70. Yeah. Because that continued. Complete end then, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, and why is the reason for that? Uh, Jerusalem was destroyed as well yeah. as the temple, and there yeah. was no other place for them to sacrifice. Yeah. I, I always try to put myself into these pictures. Do you suppose somebody was ever was asked to go back and try to sew those, the curtain back together? 
What, what happened to that curtain? Did they make a new one? They say it was seven inches thick. Yeah. Whoa. I don't even know how you would make such a thing. It's amazing. Just unless it's multiple multiple curtains, sort of stuck together somehow or other. Anyway, the author of Hebrews and conservative Christians think that was Paul. Rep repeatedly touched on the theme of Christ as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Rev uh, Hebrews chapter seven especially focuses on that, and it, it focuses on Jesus as a priest in what kind of order? Melchizedek. Melchizedek. The order of Melchizedek. Where in the world did he come from? The Bible doesn't say. <laughs> but he must have come from somewhere. Yeah, he must but, have come uh, from somewhere. He was the king of what was in those days the predecessor of Jerusalem. Uh, the king of, of peace. Uh, king of Salem, the peace, king of peace. His name, Melchizedek, means the king of righteousness. And, and where did he come out of? I mean, he's like a Job. You know, where did he come from? What happened to his descendants? I mean, and so what does Paul do with Melchizedek? <clears throat> Well, he says that Christ came, is, is in the same vein as a high priest because he wasn't part of uh, uh, Levi's descendant. Okay, so... He, he wasn't part of the, the usual... Exactly. So to the, to the Jews living in Jesus' day, in order to be a priest, you had to belong to what tribe? You've Levi. already said. The tribe of Levi. So here he's trying to make a case for the fact that Jesus, who was from what tribe? Judah. The tribe of Judah, that was the tribe of the kings. So he's saying, here we have someone from the tribe of the kings who's also supposed to be a priest. And how did that happen? Well, let me tell you about someone way back in Abraham's day who was a king and a priest. So who is that person who was a king and a priest? Melchizedek. It's Jesus. It was Melchizedek back then. Mm -hmm. It's Jesus now. And so he, he sidesteps the whole issue. Uh, of, of, okay, how is he related to Aaron? How is he, you know? And, and you know, it's pretty hard to argue with his, with his logic there because he basically says, yeah, let me tell you about someone who even preceded Levi because in effect he was in the loins of Abraham uh, when, and Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. So I want to tell you someone who's the modern Melchizedek. And I think he did a marvelous job about it. Well, Jackie, I guess you're, you. I no, it's Dennis. You're Dennis. You're up next. And this is from the Adult Sabbath School uh, Bible Study Guide for Tuesday, May 1st. Christ is able to save completely because of several qualifications that no other priest could ever have. One, he is God who has authority to forgive sins. Two, he has a permanent priesthood. Uh, three, during the Christian era, era he is interceding all the time for his people with the same loving compassion as when he healed the sick and comforted the lonely on earth. Four, he is also human but was born sinless and remained that way. And five, he was the sinless one who died under the staggering weight of the sum total of human sin. Only he, then, as the God-man, can intercede for sinners in heaven's sanctuary. Okay, now in that I have a question, in that statement. What is implied by the words, the staggering weight of the sum total of human sin? What does that mean? He associated himself with fallen man. Okay, that's a good answer. Anybody else want to add something to that? Well, certainly he suffered everything that sin could possibly make a person suffer. For. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, no question. But there are people who think that somehow or other, sins are all gathered up into some a big pile and they're put on Jesus. Is that, is that possible? The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. Well, did that happen also in the Garden of Gethsemane? When Jesus fell dying to the ground? Desire of Ages 693? What, what needs to happen for sin to be dealt with? once and for all. 
Because that's what, that's what Romans 8, 3 says. Do Satan's accusations and questions against God need to be dealt with? Does the truth about God only the truth about God only needed to be demonstrated once for the benefit of human beings as well as all the beings of the rest of the universe? In other words, the great controversy involves how many people in the universe? All of them. All of them. All of them. Not just us on this one little planet. Everybody needs to see the truth about God. So it involves all of us. Jesus, through his life and death, proved the truthfulness of God's statements back in the Garden of Eden. That's just one of the main things that he did. It has been stated that Christ's death on the cross was sufficient for every human being. What does that imply? They don't need any more information or yeah. teaching. It was, it was everything he did because before he died, he says, I've accomplished the work you gave me to do. Yeah. So, would it be theoretically possible for everyone to be saved by what Jesus did? If they make a choice. Yeah. If, if everyone chose to do what God asked them to do, it would be possible for everybody to be saved. Yeah, but, I would put it a little differently. Yeah. Not do what he's asking us to do, oh, but sure. think as he does, sure. which would cause us to do what he Yeah, does. That's, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Doesn't sufficient, though, means that um, everybody could be convinced? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, it makes it sound like he he um, shoveled enough dirt to to fill it up, and and the weight of the dirt <laughs> equals the weight yeah. of the sin, mm -hmm. and so uh, y you do a good trade, and and it's just another buy off. Now, you know there are yes. Go ahead. I got a, a notice here in uh, Hebrews nine uh, twenty eight. So Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time not to deal with sin but to save or you could say heal those who are eagerly waiting for him mm. yeah okay. so the that first time when he was here uh, 2,000 years ago he yeah. dealt with sin in, right. and on all of necessary phases when he de and it comes again it's to rescue or whatever but it, for those that have made up their mind those those yeah. who've taken advantage of yeah. what he offered when, when somebody's healed what happens their thinking changes yeah and their sins diminish as they grow in their thinking which is all about love and uh, as a gro love grows sin grows away. so so healing is it's changing somebody's mind yep. yes yeah i thought it was it's not by pancreatic cancer, it's my, the way I think about God. It's that simple. Well, that's what I thought it, that healing was, pan, mm -hmm. panthea, the, the cancer and stuff. It's a cancer of your thinking. Yeah. Cancer of your thinking. Okay. Hebrews makes it very clear that the sanctuary where Jesus is serving now is where? It's in heaven. It's in heaven. It's not on this earth. It's not anything. We can go rush to Jerusalem or someplace else and see it. It's in heaven. So, are there animals being sacrificed up there? No. no. In fact, you could, you, there's, in, what is it, uh, Jeremiah 7, 22, I said, he said, when they came out of the children of Israel, God said, I did not give them instructions regarding sacrifices and burnt offerings. Mm -hmm. NIV says, I did not just give them sac instructions which is just the opposite. Every translation except the NIV says it. I didn't give it. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, there's many passages. I don't want sacrifices. I don't want or, or bird offerings. Come now, let us reason together. That means we're going to do some thinking and, and do some learning uh, from the master teacher. Some of the more traditional, a number of the more traditional translations say that in Romans 8, I mean, sorry, Romans 3, 25 and 26, he came to offer a propitiation. Oh, What's that? Painful. Yeah. All made up, all, all that first portion of, the, of, the, of that verse is just made up out of the presupposition on the part of the translators at best. Okay, well, and, and people have often interpreted that to mean that Jesus came and lived and died to assuage the Father's wrath. What do we do with that? Well, the problem is we, we better start out by defining what God's wrath is, which yeah. uh, the, the ch two chapters before is Romans 1, 18, yeah. 24, 26, and 28. Explains yeah. what God's wrath is. God 
permitting you to do as you choose. The most important, yeah, go ahead. Well, he would be pulling back so that he doesn't destroy us. Because mm -hmm. if, we, yeah. if we came into his presence, we would be destroyed. So yeah. a way has to be found so that we once again can come into his presence. Uh, which you could talk about putting away sin. Uh, in the in term, you need a mediator who can uh, uh, deal with deal the with, accusations. Deal, deal, deal with, with the you know with whatever needs to be done in order to yeah. accomplish the. This is kind of goal. interesting. You come to God's presence and you're destroyed, but yet when you go away from God's dis presence, you're destroyed. So where are we? <laughs> he was destroyed in Jesus' presence. He was known as Almighty God or Almighty God or Everlasting Father. And nobody was destroyed in his presence. But he, it was, his glory was veiled. Well, his glory is his character. Yeah. So uh, you know, we, we, we got a serious problem with semantics. Mm -hmm. Well, well more I guess that's understand. what I'm asking is the semantics. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. It's a serious yeah. problem because definitions unfortunately t uh, change over time. Yeah, if, if we understood this text to say that it was a sacrifice not of um, you know, a, a appeasement of yeah. God, yeah. but a sacrifice to produce atonement at mm. one moment, yeah. as the word was supposed to mean uh, initially. Mm. Initially, yeah. It would be to put us together, one mind. One mind with whom? With mm. Christ. Yeah. Once we all have the mind of Christ. And with God. We are, yeah. well, which is God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if, if we didn't, it should not make a distinction between the Father and Jesus. No. Because that's the but physical. Do that. I understand that that's what we're trying to uh, 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 attempting to get people to expand their understanding yeah. about the infinite one. Well, the most important questions in the great controversy have all been about God Himself or themselves, if you like. Um, and those questions have to be dealt with. And Jesus did that very, very successfully. By answering all of Satan's accusations and questions about God, Jesus prepared himself to deal with Satan's accusations and questions about us if we're faithful to, to Jesus. So look at Ephesians 2, 18. It is through Christ that all of us, Jews and Gentiles, are able to come in the one spirit into the presence of the Father. 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ died for sins once and for all, a good man on behalf of sinners, in order to lead you to God. He was put to death physically, but made alive spiritually. So, let me jump back over here. These verses make it quite clear that all people could be saved by the sacrifice of Christ. Christ dealt with sins once and for all. Was it that the Father was reluctant to accept us until Jesus paid the price? Not at all. Does Jesus need now to go to heaven and plead with the Father before he will accept us? Jackie, I think you have the next one there, John 16. So, this is Jesus speaking. <coughs> I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use these fig figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. When that day comes, you will ask Him in my name, and I do not say that I will ask Him on your behalf. For the Father Himself loves you. Amen. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. Thank you. Boy, powerful. So how, how can it be that the whole Old Testament system, where they were told, you can't go into the sanctuary, the priest has to do it for you, and all the way up there, it, it seemed like you can't do anything without a priest there for you, and yet now at the very end of Christ's life, just before that curtain is ripped from top to bottom, he says, you know, you real, really don't need a priest. That's mm, I'm not sure that I would go that far. Go that far. In well, you don't, need a, you don't need a priest to, we need a priest, but we don't need a priest to approach the Father. This is uh, from Ellen White Manuscript 50, uh, 1900 on 1078 of the 
Bible commentary. The religious services, the prayers, the praise, the penitent confession of the sin ascended from true believers as incense to the heavenly sanctuary. But passing through the corrupt channels of humanity, they are so defiled that unless purified by blood, they can never be of value with God. They ascend not in spotless purity, and unless the intercessor who is at God's right hand presents and purifies all by his righteousness, it is not acceptable to God. All incense from earthly tabernacles must be moist with the cleansing drops of the blood of Christ. He holds before the Father the center, censer of his own merits in which there is no taint of earthly corruption. He gathers into his censer the prayers, the praise, and the confessions of his people, and with these he puts his own spotless righteousness. Then, perfumed with the merits of Christ's propitiation, the incense comes up before God, holy and entirely acceptable. Then gracious answers are returned. And she said, goes on a little bit yeah. more. So it's not about God's willingness. There is some, some difficulty beyond that. In order to be just and the justifier, something has to be done beyond just his, his uh, uh, graciousness, uh, his mercy. You know, mm -hmm. Mercy is one side of it, but justice is another side. And justice isn't just legal stuff. It's, no. it's does it work? Yeah, there's, there's no question about the fact that God's righteousness is an uh, absolutely essential part of that and how we get to that. Um, that presentation there is uh, a challenge because there's, there's, there are more than one, there's clearly more than one intercessor mentioned in, in the Bible. First of all, Romans 8 very clearly presents there's a Holy Spirit interceding for us in prayers. That sounds more like what you've just read. No. And then there's Jesus. No, uh, this is talking about Jesus, because yeah. she had talked about in the but previous, I'm, I didn't read the previous, yeah, no. but the Spirit works on our hearts, draws us, and says, yeah. the gratitude which flows from our lips is a result of the Spirit striking the chords of the soul. But what I'm saying is the, the, the job that Jesus is described as doing there is basically what Romans 8 says the Spirit does. Mm. Uh, he, he, t he takes our prayers and, and, and then he, 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 speaks to, uh, he speaks, well, let me just read it to you. Right. This is this is actually commentary tied to that verse. So yeah. Um, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, all of a sudden, I got a blank here. Well. Um, uh, let me just read while you're looking for that. Christ, our mediator, this is the paragraph before that. Uh -huh. And the Holy Spirit are constantly interceding on man's behalf. But the Spirit pleads not for us as does Christ who presents his blood, mm -hmm. shed from the foundation of the world. Uh, the Spirit works upon our hearts and so forth and so on to bring out our praise and, and such. And then she goes into how... Christ is the one who pleads the blood. Yeah. Here's the, here's the verse in, in Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are, for we do not, how to, we do not know how to, we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us and groans that words cannot express. And that's, that's kind of the idea of this. And, and God sees who, what's in our hearts and so forth. So that's sort of that same idea. Um, so and Romans 8 clearly makes it, makes it clear that all three members of the Godhead are on our side. And I think yes. that's really important to see. Um, but there are some other challenges in that presentation that we don't have time to deal with right now. Well, um, you were talking about, you know, not being able to enter into the most holy place and all this. And then at the end, the veil gets ripped. Yeah. To me, that's, that's kind of a metaphor for understanding. Mm -hmm. The um, people couldn't go in because they didn't understand. When Jesus came and died and did all his things, well, then we learned about God. And in that case, uh, since we knew more about God, it'd be like ripping the veil. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's yeah. kind of how I see that. Well, in the, let's, let's go to the sanctuary system. In the... Old Testament, there was two portions to the sanctuary. There's the holy place and there's the most holy place. The holy place 
the priest went in every day, he did all these things and so forth, atoned for sin, carrying the sins in figure into the, into the temple. But then on the Day of Atonement, those sins were taken out of the sanctuary and put on the head of the scapegoat, and the scapegoat was taken off into a far place where he could never come back. So there are two distinct parts to the ministry of uh, were in the Old Testament. Now, what about Jesus' work in heaven right now? Are there two parts to his ministry? Seventh-day Adventists said yes. There is the daily ministry where he pleads on our behalf, just as the, oh, oh, I mean, he, he, he speaks on our behalf. And, and if we read Daniel um, 7 and we read Zechariah 3 and we read other places like Revelation 12 where we see who the, Revelation 12, 10, where we see who is the accuser of the brethren, his pleading each day is in response to Satan's accusations. So that's what happens in the heavenly sanctuary. Satan accuses us and Jesus responds by answering those accusations. Um, and, but then on the Day of Atonement, we need to talk about what happens to that. The Day of Atonement is described in Leviticus 16. And uh, Jim, I think you have Hebrews 9 that fits to Leviticus 16. Hebrews 9, 24. Yeah. For Christ has entered, not into a sanctuary made with hands, a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Okay, and our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide adds to, in comment with that, Jesus is the forerunner, having entered as our representative into the heavenly sanctuary, even into the very presence of God for us. That is, Jesus is standing before the Father, ministering the merits of his atonement, the eternal redemption that he obtained in our behalf. So what does ministering the merits of his atonement mean? We're still dealing with lots of semantics here, aren't we? Yes, and it, it's complicated. It's not like uh, the, if you think of the plan of salvation, like the, the knowledge you need to build a car versus the knowledge you need to drive a car. Mm -hmm. They're two different things. And so these things that we're studying, we're going to be studying throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. So obviously we're not going to have uh, a complete picture even now. Mm -hmm. uh, but we should press on. So in that accusation, Daniel 7, again, we turn now to Daniel 7, 9, and 10, how many people are watching and listening and involved with that accusations and answers and so forth going on in heaven? Nobody's quite sure. The whole universe. Sure. The whole universe, yeah. Hundreds, Daniel 7 says 100 million plus. Doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't say there. So why would that be? I mean, these guys are, gonna, are being expected someday to welcome us to heaven and say, you know, come and live next door to me. And they say, hold on, <laughs> just a minute. I'm not so sure about this person I'm inviting in to live next door to me. So they have a right to ask any questions they have at that point in time. And that's what's going on now in that uh, end time or pre-advent judgment. In order to correctly understand what the scriptures teach, we need to remember that Christ is pleading before the Father in response to the accusations of Satan before the entire universe, that's Daniel 7, 9 and 10, and against our accuser, Zechariah 3, 1 to 5, and Revelation 12, 10. I wish we had time to read all these verses. If we did not have Jesus Christ answer Satan's accusations against us, our case, cases would be hopeless. Satan would paint the worst possible picture of every sinner and then claim that he is the rightful one to deal with their lives. Considering all the terrible and unfair accusations that Satan has made against God, who is completely perfect and faultless, what kind of accusations could Satan make against us as sinners and rebels against God? I mean, try to just imagine it. Well, there's a verse in Hebrews 9 that has been understood in many ways and we probably need to deal with. It's, called, it's Hebrews 9.22. Indeed, according to the law, that would be, what's, what's Paul talking about? Or the author of Hebrews, what's he talking about? He says the law. The Torah. At least the Torah, maybe the whole Old Testament. Mm -hmm. 
Almost everything is purified by blood, and sins are forgiven only if blood is poured out. Now, now that word, that word forgiven, is not. My understanding is uh, a better way to translate it is uh, for remission. Mm -hmm. Remission has to do with healing. Mm -hmm. Forgiven, it, you don't need. To, uh, everybody's is forgiven, whether anybody's blood was poured or not. So mm -hmm. we've got two different paradigms. And uh, which one is correct? Mm -hmm. I think the King James is better. It says uh, 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 remission as opposed to forgiven. Everybody being forgiven is a... Uh, well, if we confess our sins, we, he is... Even if you, you don't have to confess your sins, you're still forgiven. You may be a fool for not uh, recognizing that you've got a sin problem uh, that needs healing, but, uh, man... Well... Definitions are, are very important that we get the wrong mm -hmm. slant on things. I, I think that we could bring the accusation, that picture of uh, the devil uh, in front of God. Uh, it's important to remember that he comes to individuals and tell mm -hmm. them lies about themselves and try to make them believe God couldn't possibly save you. Yeah. Or me. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. He uh, would like us all to believe that. So, keep Jesus in f at the forefront of your mind, mm -hmm. uh, pleading for you and giving everything necessary for your salvation. Mm -hmm. And when you look at him, how can we be lost? Yeah. Exactly. No way. How do you go to the... Pleading. I don't. I don't understand how the pleading fits. Well, okay. I because I because didn't that. he say that um, I don't. I don't have to ask the Father for your. Okay. What is that? What okay. is that verse? In, in, Pray to the Father for you because the Father loves you Himself. The the Spirit of Truth. Information about God. Teachings by the Jesus is available for everybody, and it's God wants you to learn. But he can't force feed it to you. He can't do some magic or mystical trip on you. And he surely does not need to plead with the Father. The Father loves you himself. So let me, let me just clarify that. The word in Greek, the, 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 the construction of the Greek sentence where it talks about pleading with the Father doesn't say pleading with the Father. It says literally pleading before the Father. That's what it says literally in the Greek. Well, and so what's happening there, Zechariah 3 is very clear. Satan is accusing and Jesus is defending. And Father is, the Father is basically just saying, make sure that everybody gets their questions answered. But he's, de he's not he's, defending he's not, us to the Father. No, 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 okay? no, no. He is, it, 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 everything, everything God does is open. He says, yeah. come now, let us reason together, so on and so forth. But he's trying to get our attention, well, whether individually or corporately or whatever, but it's not to change God's mind or the Father's no, mind no. or Jesus' this, mind. This has nothing to do with changing God's mind. It, it, it has to deal... See, Satan would like the whole universe to believe that none of us are savable. That's true. Absolutely true. So, and in response to that, Jesus has to say, no, there are some of them are savable, and this is why. So Satan makes his accusations, and Jesus defends, and the Father is there just sort of keeping the score. And uh, Well, when you talk about plead, it, it sounds like, come on, that's please, the way, please, please, yeah, please type of thing. But you're talking more like the plead, like pleading, pleading guilty or innocent, mm -hmm. yeah. and he's pleading. So what's happening when he's pleading, Fred? To me, he's pleading the cause of the Father. Yeah. And he's trying to get us to understand the what well, he came to reveal the Father. Yeah, that was his mission. Therefore, Absolutely. what he's doing is trying to reveal to us what the Father is. He's pleading the cause of the Father with us. Father doesn't need to learn anything. We do. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, in where I see I'm running out of time here. After clearly understanding about the earthly sanctuary service, do we understand the different, two different aspects of Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary? Seventh-day Adventists have looked very carefully at Daniel 7, 8, and 9 and concluded that that secondary, that second step, that Day of Atonement stuff, 
is what has happened since the year 1844 until the, the time of the Second Coming. Uh, that's uh, something I wish we had time to talk about. We'll probably get a chance to do so later, but um, I'm going to jump over that stuff right now because we just don't have time. Ellen White had a number of very significant things to say about the sanctuary service in heaven. Heaven, notice these important words. Carrie? Yes, as anciently the sins of the people were by faith placed upon the sin offering and through its blood transferred in figure to the earthly sanctuary, so in the new covenant the sins of the repentant are by faith placed upon Christ and transferred in fact to the heavenly sanctuary. And as the typical cleansing of the earthly was accomplished by the removal of sins by which it had been polluted, so the actual cleansing of the heavenly is to be accomplished by the removal or blotting out of the sins which are there recorded. But before this can be accomplished, there must be an examination of the books of record to determine who, through repentance of sin and faith in Christ, are entitled to the benefits of his atonement. The cleansing of the sanctuary therefore involves a work of investigation, a work of judgment. This work must be performed prior to the coming of Christ to redeem his people, for when he, for, yes, for when he comes, his reward is with him to give to every man according to his works. And that deals with Revelation 22.12, comes from the Great Controversy, page 421, paragraph 3 through 422. So let's summarize those last words. What are the two things that she pointed out that must happen in order for us to benefit from his atonement? One, our sins must be transferred to the heavenly sanctuary and be blotted out. Now, the transfer of sins to the heavenly sanctuary, we understand, happens because God has a complete record. We don't know how he records those sins, but he has a complete record, and those, that record is in the heavenly sanctuary. Two, a pre-advent judgment must take place to see who is entitled to salvation. That is, in order to better understand exactly what happened in the earthly sanctuary system, read Leviticus 16, which we don't have time to do right now, where it describes the events of the Day of Atonement. And Fred, do you want to read those couple of verses for us? Uh, yes, uh, Leviticus 16, verses uh, 15 and 16. After that, he shall kill the goat for the sins, for the sin, singular, offering of the people, bring its blood into the most holy place and sprinkle it on the lid and then in front of the covenant box, as he did with the bull's blood. In now the bull's, let me just interrupt for a second. We didn't take time to read the paragraphs before that, but the bull's blood was for his own sins. Right. So that was the first part, and now you're talking about the second part. In this way, he will perform the ritual of, uh, to purify the most holy place from the uncleanliness of the people of Israel and from all their sins. He must do this to the tent because it stands in the middle of the camp, which is ritually unclean. So it's, it's very essential to understand who is the accuser and who is the defender in the great controversy. We must understand clearly the role of Satan and the role of each member of the Godhead in the judgment. And we've already looked at Romans 8. We must understand the concerns of the rest of the universe as our cases are being considered. We must understand why Jesus had to come and die to demonstrate the truth about God's character and government. We must recognize the major questions that have been raised in the great controversy and how God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ have answered those questions. We must recognize that we are now in the antitypical day of atonement where when every case must be finally decided. God has pledged not to leave any question unanswered. As Jim said a little bit earlier, God's government is totally and completely transparent. The entire universe must be convinced of the rightness of his plan of salvation. Since he plans to bring some of us rebels back into the heavenly kingdom, those who already live there have a right to know for sure that that is safe. So how important is this? Gary? The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death he began that work which after his resurrection he ascended to complete in heaven. 
we must by faith enter within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, entered. Hebrews uh, 6, 20. Gary, I'm going to ask you, because you've read the most important part. We're going to jump down because otherwise we're not going to get this finished. God's government has been a continued. By the way, that was from Spirit of Prophecy, uh, Volume 4, page 313, also in Great Controversy 489, for those of you who want to check it out. God's government has, has been and continues to be completely transparent. We've already mentioned that. So how should that impact us? If we are willing to recognize that our lives are an open book, then we will be more careful about our actions. Furthermore, we can rejoice that Jesus Christ is there in heaven, pleading our cases before the entire universe, not just before the Father, before the entire universe, and answering the accusations of our adversary. Dennis, I think you're next. Christ's intercessory ministry on behalf of sinners is one of the most challenging doctrines, not only because it concerns the heavenly realm, but also because our understanding of it makes us almost unique among Christians and other believers. It is not enough to repeat that this topic is important. We should learn to think about the meaning and the significance of this process that takes place in heaven and concerns our personal destiny and the destiny of the world. Engage with your class in a frank discussion of Christ's high priestly work, searching for ways to make this topic clear, convincing, and relevant from the Bible study guide. Yeah, and I would like to just point out why other Christians don't accept our views on this thing. Many of them do not believe in the prophecies of Daniel. Two, because of their understanding of the nature of man, they do not believe in a pre-advent judgment. Why would God conduct a judgment for dead people who are already either in heaven or hell? That doesn't make any sense. Satan is doing everything he possibly can, and this is probably the biggest factor, to prevent people from understanding his true position and role in the great controversy. Our Christian friends have never been exposed to the ideas of the great controversy, so how could they possibly understand it? So, in this lesson, we have briefly covered Christ's sacrifice as the Passover lamb, his great high priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, the eschatological day of atonement. Um, we've tried to answer the question, did Jesus really have to die to deal with our sins? And we would say yes. He did not die of crucifixion. Remember, he died of separation from God, which is the ultimate result of sin. We've run out of time. We hope we have suggested some things for you to think about. Our kind and loving Father, we know that these things are challenging. There's a lot of questions that it raises when we look at these issues. Um, we ask that those who have had an opportunity to listen today will be able to think it through and, and study for themselves so that they, along with us, might have a better understanding of these challenging ideas. We pray this thing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.